smartest film critic in the world, Cole Smithy. Hi, this is Cole Smithy with ColeSmithy.com and your guide to what to see and what to avoid at the movies this week. Though it suffers from a third act jump that makes you wonder where four or five ostensibly missing scenes went, Love is Strange resonates as a heartfelt allegory about committed gay relationships in modern day America. Glasses, I can't find my glasses. Has anybody seen my glasses? Please go on today. Two of Broadway's most reliable actors, John Lithgow and Alfred Molina as an elderly New York couple, capture the audience's imagination before the movie starts. Co-writer-director Ira Sachs builds upon the recent legalization of gay marriage to explore lingering underlying hypocrisies that twist what should be an equalizing influence into a double-edged sword for gay couples who tie the knot. Society is Mean might be a more applicable title, for it is not the palpable human connection of tenderness that seems strange, but rather our culture of intolerance that comes across as bizarre. Ben, played by Lithgow, and George, played by Melina, are like two gay uncles everyone wishes they had. They've been together for 40 years, living in a comfortable Manhattan apartment. Even if one member of the couple hasn't always been monogamous, a fact referenced in one of the film's beautifully intimate scenes between Ben and George, their desire and admiration for one another is sincere. George teaches music at a Catholic prep school and gives private piano instruction to would-be classical pianists. Chopin is in the repertoire and throughout the soundtrack. Ben, the elder of the pair, paints. Thanks to the endorsement of the state of New York, Ben and George get married in a small outdoor ceremony that introduces us to their loyal friends and family members. My friend is here. We need to work on a school presentation, and there's nowhere else for us to. Ooh. That's so gay. He doesn't mean homosexual, Uncle Ben. He just means stupid. Hey, Sadly, the harmony of so much goodwill for these two rare men is soon broken by the archdiocese overseeing the school where George teaches. Without regard to how well George does his job or how much his students love him, or even considering the fact that the school's staff and pupils are familiar with his gayness, George is abruptly fired. The Catholic Church's sucker punch to George's and Ben's marriage and financial reality leaves them unable to keep their apartment and their way of life. Humbled but optimistic, the newlyweds are driven to ask friends and family to put them up until George finds a new job so the couple can find a new apartment. While George takes up residence with a gay couple of New York City police officers he calls police women, Ben is relegated to his nephew Elliot's top floor apartment. It doesn't take long for Ben to wear out his welcome with Elliot's stay-at-home author wife Kate, played by Marissa Tomei, and their gawky teenage son, Joey. Living apart from one another, however briefly, magnifies the malice inflicted on Ben and George by a Catholic church that effectively trashes their life and speeds up their aging process. Love, in this case between two older men, is revealed as a defiant political act. Still, its fragile personal nature means that the couple's union has no traction in a society that treats something of such rarity with abuse and scorn. Hey, can I have some private time, please? When you live with people, you know them better than you care to. Love is Strange turns on Ben's distantly positive influence on Joey, whose resentment toward his uncle morphs into a sense of romantic hopefulness. But the question remains, how long will that precious attitude hold up in a society that values guns and money above all else? I give this good romantic drama a B. My sleeper pick is to be Takai, and my guilty pleasure pick is The Prince. My must-have DVDs are Vengeance is Mine from Criterion, United States of Secrets from PBS, and Breathless from Masterpiece.
Elan Grenet's transcendent filmic parlor game remains an innovative and exquisitely executed example of minimalist filmmaking used to evoke mystery, romance, and a sprinkle of social invective. The feuillage ancien, comme si le sol était un cours de sable de gravier, de dalles de pierre, sur lequel je m'avançais une fois de plus. Traces of Bauhaus, surrealism, and Dadaism abound, though they are wrapped in richly designed Baroque filigree. Tuxedoed and evening gowned partygoers interact in a grand ornate international hotel that is astonishingly lavish. Chandeliered hallways stretch for as far as the eye can see. Marble interiors with high gilded ceilings and mirror-covered walls overlook a vast formal garden punctuated by geometric topiary designs that add to the film's glacial allure. René used the palace at Nymphenburg and the park at Schlesem to create a landscape that would well represent a European version of heaven on earth. Past, present, and future exist at once. Composition and style are as important to last year at Marion Bed as the eerie displacement of its veiled narrative regarding a love triangle as played out in an otherworldly palace. René hypnotizes his audience with a repeated phrase from an unseen narrator. Silent rooms where the sound of footsteps is absorbed by carpets so heavy, so thick that all sound escapes the ear. The audience is placed in a cultural and generational vacuum where all human emotion and expression is tempered. Social interactions conform to strict codes of behavior. No one eats. Everyone poses. Every move and gesture is choreographed so that an ever-present state of stillness serves as a black and white textured background. Well-dressed bodies put on airs that pass for responsible social behavior. However, the rules are slackened during gambling games between male rivals when an atmosphere of competitive one-upsmanship takes over. Among René's austere humanoids is a young brunette beauty known simply as A, played by Delphine Sirig. X, played by Giorgio Albertazzi, is the closest thing the audience has to a protagonist. He's a desperate romantic motor of energy. Although A remembers nothing of it, X tries to convince her that they had a passionate love affair last year. I've never been in any bedroom with you, A insists. X maintains that they are reuniting to fulfill her promise to make love to him and abandon her ostensible husband, M, played by Sasha Petuif, a con man gambler who never loses. René uses dynamic quick cuts between dark and bright stagnant imagery. An object, a gesture, a decor, reads the film's tagline. René creates a romantic synergy with these few ideas kept firmly in the viewer's mind. Like the gambling game that M uses to take money from all comers, the movie is built on a complex formula. M's signature game involves laying out rows of objects such as matchsticks. Each player can remove as many matchsticks as he wants from one row at a time. The object is not to be left with a matchstick. Et une fois de plus, tout était désert dans cet hôtel immense. Tout était vide. The contest speaks to the game that René is playing with his audience. There's no way for the audience to win, but you can enjoy attempting to solve the riddle. Thanks for watching, and visit colesmithy.com for more.